Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth.
we believe that in the beginning God created all things. And His ultimate creation, you and I, man, was created in the only part of God's creation, created in God's image as well. Adam and Eve created in God's image. They were created perfectly. We used to say back in the 70s when I was in the youth group, God don't make no junk. So when God created Adam and Eve, that initial creation, He didn't create junk. He created perfect human beings. It was mankind that messed everything up. It was mankind and the disobedience of that first man and first woman that ended up making God's creation jump. And that's still happening today. Let me read several passages from for you. Look over at Psalm 19. Again, more words of David. Recognizing who God is. And as we do that, recognizing who we are as man. Look at Psalm 19, verse, verse 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky is proclaiming the work of His hand. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all of the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens He has pitched a tent for the sun. God's very own creation declares His glory. God's very own creation declares His praise. That's what we are to do as man. That's why God created us to bring Him, His self, God Almighty, to bring Him glory. Look at Psalm 66. Psalm 66 and verse 4. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Then it says there in verse 5, Come and see what God has done, how awesome His works in man's behalf. God didn't create this world just for Himself. God didn't need creation. God didn't create us. For himself. God doesn't need us. God created in order that he might bring himself glory through his creation and through us. Would God still receive glory even if we didn't exist, even if creation didn't exist? Absolutely he would. Because God is enough. He is God. He's enough to glorify himself. But because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his grace, he created this world for us, and He gave us dominion over this world, over all of creation, as we see in the passage this morning. But all of creation declares the praise of God, and God created man to do the same, to declare His praises and declare His glory. So when we come together each and every Sunday morning or Wednesday or whenever we gather together as corporate worship, how does that change your attitude about what worship should be? If right now the trees and the mountains and the oceans and seas or whatever are out there right now declaring the praise of God, how much more as we profess and proclaim to be believers and followers of Jesus Christ, how much more when we gather together as corporate body believers should we declare the praises and the glory of Jesus Christ? Look over in Isaiah chapter 43. Already right now. Isaiah chapter 43. Look at verse 20. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Why are we created? Again, to bring glory and honor back to God. To declare His praise. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Very familiar passage to many of you I know. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. The old has gone. And the new has come. And all of this is from 
God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and also gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God created us to be relational creatures. He created us to interact, to communicate, to work together, to labor together. Certainly for the advancement of the cause of His kingdom but also to continue the work of Christ here on this earth as a body, as one body, believers and followers of Jesus Christ. It says here in the passage, we are a new creation, the old way of living, the old life, that life that was controlled and consumed and enslaved by sin, that's gone. God's taken all of that away. He's removed our sins as far as from the east as from the west. And the new now has come. And that part of that new is that not only are we reconciled back to God, brought back into a right relationship and fellowship with Him, but also that we are reconciled one to another. Because when sin entered this world, part of its destruction, part of its disruption, is that relationship that man has with man himself, and that we have with one another. And so God has reconciled all that together. Last passage right here, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. By your will, they were created and have their being. Why are you able to come and sit right here in this very place this morning? The simple answer is this. Because God willed it so, and He allowed you this morning to wake up and to take your breath and to exhale that carbon dioxide and to wake up this morning and to function and to live as a living being, but also you're here this morning because God willed it so, so that we might declare His praise and bring Him glory. I saw a recent posting, I mentioned this before, of a pastor that I knew as we were growing up. At one point, this pastor, he was over a Baptist church, a pretty big church in Atlanta, and he then kind of went to the Baptist church and now he's in a Presbyterian church. I just want to read to you what he said about it. Just read you this part of this posting he put on Facebook the other day. He said, I believe in creation and I accept the scientific facts of evolution. This instructs me that the Creator God is creating still and is ever evolving along with creation. You know, last week as we talked about God, one of the characteristics and traits of God, God the Father, all the God, all the triune God is, God is immutable, which means God is unchanging. If God changed or varied in His character and His traits and His being in any way, shape, or form, the slightest little bit, He would not be God anymore. So I totally disagree with this. God is not evolving along with creation. God created creation. So why would God evolve along with creation? Creation doesn't control God. God is sovereign over all of creation, including us, you and me. By the way, the Bible doesn't teach anything about evolution, of the evolution of man. If anything, the Bible tells us that man is devolving. In other words, without the means, the provision that God has given us for salvation, there is no hope. Man is doomed without it. So, so much for man's beginnings. How about man's failure? Again, let me read from the Baptist Faith and Message. i got to speed it up here. By his free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. As soon as they are capable of moral action, they, man, become transgressors and are under condemnation. 
Excuse me. See, God gave us, gave man free choice. Again, what an evidence of the great and loving God that we have. I mean, he could have just simply created a bunch of robots and forced them to do whatever it is he wanted us to do. But no, he gave us free choice. He created us with a mind. He created us with the, with the ability to think, with the ability to reason. He, he gave each and every one of us unique personalities. He gave us the ability to express emotions like love and, and hate and joy and sadness and anger and remorse and so on and so forth. You see, man is the only part of God's creation created in God's image. We are not evolving animals. We are humans uniquely formed by a loving and personal God. As it says again, the words of David in Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well, David says. But because of man's capability to make choices, that first man and that first woman through temptation of Satan, they chose to disobey God's one commandment that he gave them. And now all of mankind, all of mankind is under the, 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 the penalty of sin. That debt of sin. Sin has entered this world and by nature we inherit that, that inclination to rebel, to sin against God, to serve self. And as a result of sin coming into the world, <coughs> with it came immorality, came sickness, came hatred, came hostility, came death. All of mankind now is under the condemnation of sin. No person is exempt. As Romans 3.23 tells us very simply, all of us have sinned and we've all fallen short of God's glory, God's standard there. No matter how hard I tried, climb that mountain, it's going to be extremely difficult for me to reach the very top. But as I try to become closer to God, and I want to tell you this morning, yes, it's not an easy thing to discipline yourself, to spend the time necessary in His Word and in prayer and in fellowship with other believers and all those things that bring you closer to God. It's not easy to be disciplined enough to do that. But God has made a way for us to do that through His Son, Jesus Christ. He's made it easier than it was before Christ came. We're about to Wednesday night in a few weeks start looking at the book of Leviticus. And I told them on Wednesday night to come to prayer meeting. I said, well, we look at the book of Leviticus and talk about all the sacrifices that God's people had to make. Old Testament sacrifices are certainly going to make you appreciate grace so much more. All the sin falls short of the glory of God. We're all born into this world as sinful and rebellious people. We've inherited that nature from the first man and the first woman because we are all descendants from them. And Romans 5.12 tells us, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. You see, the Greek word for that word fall, we talk about man's fall, the Greek word is a very interesting word. It's hamartado. It simply means to miss the mark. So therefore, having no share in the prize. Did you get that? The fall. We've missed the mark. We've missed God's standard. And because of that, because of sin that separates us from God, we have no share in God's reward apart from Jesus Christ. So we as sinful people, we have certainly missed God's heart. And it's this sin in us, in all human beings, that destines us for an eternity separated from God. Here's the last point, man's remedy. Again, from the Baptist faith message. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God. The sacredness of human personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and in that Jesus Christ died for man. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him 
Christ, the Messiah, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And as God's fellow workers, Paul says, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, the Lord, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. And I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. See, man's only hope as sinful, dying people separated from our Creator because of our sin is to be reconciled back to that right relationship with God. That's what we call righteousness. It's being in right standing, a right relationship with God. And that's only done by His grace that's been given to us through faith in His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The greatest truth that we can understand about ourselves, the greatest truth that we can understand about humanity as a whole, is that we, all of us, are hopelessly lost sinners and we are desperately in need of God's grace. And every time that God saves a sinner, that God saves a sinner, it is to His glory, because salvation is of the Lord, and it's only by His grace and only by His mercy that we are saved, as Ephesians 2 tells us. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It is a gift of God, and it's not by works, so that none of us can brag and boast of what we've done about earning favor with God. It says that we are God's workmanship. God is still doing a work in your heart and in your life as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And that work will not be completed until the day you stand face to face before Him. When we are God's workmanship and we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Good works for His kingdom. Good works that honor and glorify God. That bring Him praise and bring Him glory. And our purpose in life is not to glorify ourselves. Our purpose in life is to, whatever we do, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, we do it to the glory of God. And so if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, if you have not publicly professed Him as your Lord and Savior, surrendering your life to Him, it's impossible for you to do that. That everything you do is for God's glory. The Bible says if you do not have Christ, that you are actually an enemy of God. Now you might think you're a good enough person to earn God's favor. But if you've never surrendered your heart and life to Christ, if He is not your Lord and Savior, if He's not sitting on the throne of your life, the Bible clearly says that you are an enemy of God. So as an enemy of God, how can you glorify Him? Jesus said, either God is your Father. And he also said, no one comes to the Father but through him. But he said, either God's your Father or Satan is your Father. There's no middle ground. So, Lord, what is man that you are mindful of me? This morning, for our time of decision, I just simply ask each and every one of you here, have you really come to terms with your own sinful nature and recognize your need for a Savior? Jesus also said, He says, Come, all of you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And if you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have never entered into that personal relationship with Him that He so desires to have with you as well, you've never placed your faith and trust in Him for forgiveness of sins and, and that gift that comes from God, the gift of eternal life, you can do it today because now, today, is the day of salvation. Let me add one more little thing to this point. Jesus also said this regarding forgiveness and God's forgiveness of us. He tells us in His Word, He says, if you can't forgive your brother, or your sister, or someone, then God will not forgive you. Straight from God's word. Straight from God's word. So first, we're told that we need to be 
reconciled to one another, to truly be reconciled to God and be put back into that right standing relationship with God, we also have to be in right standing relationship with our brothers and sisters, especially those in Christ, and be reconciled to one another. So right now, is this time of decision, that opportunity to not only take care of business with God, but if you need to take care of business with somebody else, now's the time to do it. And the only thing that's getting in your way of doing it